while anything that decreases insulin's release or activity raises blood sugar. Abnormalities of glucagon secretion also impact blood sugar, but these are far more rare. However, the insulin-glucagon paradigm of glucose homeostasis is a significant oversimplification of the process. There are at least seven other hormones involved which regulate the secretion of insulin either directly or indirectly. This diagram is discussed in detail in my insulin and glucagon video, but if we strip away all but the essentials necessary to understand treatment, we are left with this. We have three remaining hormones to worry about. These include the incretin hormones, GIP and GLP-1, which are secreted by the intestines in response to the ingestion of fat and carbohydrates. Both of these stimulate insulin release. GLP-1 in particular slows gastric emptying and promotes satiety. And both of the incretin hormones are inactivated by the enzyme DPP-4. There's also a hormone called amylin, which is co-secreted with insulin by pancreatic beta cells in response to a glucose load and acts to inhibit glucagon. There are five classes of diabetic medications which act on these pathways. First are the so-called insulin secretagogues, which include the sulfonylureas, which all end in the suffix "-ide", and meglitonides, which all end in glenide. These drugs directly trigger pancreatic beta cells to secrete insulin. GLP-1 receptor agonists, which all end in tide, do what you might imagine them to do. They increase insulin release and decrease glucagon release. But since GLP-1 also causes early satiety, these meds also lead to weight loss. The average loss is relatively modest at 1.5 to 2.5 kilograms, or about 4 to 5 pounds, but it is a nice side effect for most patients. The inhibitors of DPP-4 all end in glyptin and predictably have a similar effect as the GLP-1 receptor agonists, but are a little less effective, including being weight neutral. Last, relevant to these pathways, there is the category of amylin analogs, of which there is one currently approved called pramlatide. However, this injected medication is only approved for patients who are also on mealtime insulin and is rarely used, so I won't be discussing it further today. Beyond the pancreatic hormonal pathways, there are four more medication classes that affect glucose homeostasis. SGLT2 inhibitors, which all end in the suffix gliflozin, decrease the reabsorption of filtered glucose in the renal tubules. Thiazolidinediones, commonly known as TZDs or glitazones, after their suffix, increase tissue sensitivity to insulin. There are alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, such as acarbose, which decreases carbohydrate absorption in the intestines. This is actually neither an effective nor widely used medication and therefore won't be discussed further. And the last class of diabetes medication is actually by an enormous margin, the most prescribed, the biguanides, of which there currently is one, metformin, which acts via multiple mechanisms. At this point, of those nine medication classes, I'm going to go through the five most important ones in more detail, in descending order of their current importance, before concluding with a discussion of how to choose which one or ones to use for an actual patient. And we're starting with the biguanides, which have an interesting history, not just because they have a beginning as herbal remedies from the Middle Ages, but because the one drug, metformin, may set the record for the longest duration between initial discovery and eventual U.S. approval. Metformin and its glucose-lowering properties were originally discovered in 1922, but unfortunately this discovery went largely unrecognized as it was overshadowed by the first use of insulin to treat diabetes in that same year. There was some additional scattered research here and there, but nothing caught the attention of the broader medical community. Meanwhile, another biguanide called fenformin and its ability to lower blood glucose was discovered in 1957, and unlike metformin, fenformin became a popular alternative to insulin in type 2 diabetics. Unfortunately, it was withdrawn from the U.S. market in 1978 due to growing concerns about its association with lactic acidosis, as there remained no alternatives to insulin other than sulfonylureas at the time, interest in metformin was rekindled, leading to clinical trials and eventually a U.S. approval in 1994. 
Metformin suppresses gluconeogenesis by the liver via multiple incompletely understood mechanisms. It increases insulin-mediated, that is post-meal, glucose utilization in peripheral tissues. And there are various debated mechanisms within the gut. When it's prescribed, it's usually started at 500 mg once daily, then if necessary, up titrated to 500 mg twice a day, and then again to 1,000 mg twice a day. To minimize risk of side effects, and because it's most effective at blunting post-meal glucose spikes, it should be taken with meals. The major advantages of metformin are that it is the most effective oral agent if effectiveness is measured by lowering a patient's hemoglobin A1c, or their average blood glucose. It does not cause hypoglycemia, and it's inexpensive. Contraindications to metformin include chronic kidney disease. Over the last 10 years, we've somewhat liberalized which patients with kidney disease can receive metformin. Currently, it's recommended to not initiate it if the patient's estimated GFR is less than 45, and to discontinue it in a patient once their GFR drops below 30. Metformin is also contraindicated in severe liver disease. By a large margin, the most common side effects are diarrhea and nausea, which can be mitigated by a slow uptitration of dose over several weeks. Although it's frequently said that these side effects are only present at the initiation of therapy, they are also anecdotally a large part of metformin non-adherence. Metformin is also associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. And last, there has been a persistent lingering concern about metformin causing the same lactic acidosis that led to the downfall of fenformin. However, after much study over decades, this concern appears to be commonly overstated, and this side effect is actually quite rare. Arguably, the next most notable medication class in 2020 are the SGLT2 inhibitors. These inhibit the sodium glucose cotransporter 2 in the proximal tubule, blocking the reabsorption of filtered glucose, which leads to modest calorie wasting and an osmotic diuresis. Beneficial side effects for patients with obesity and heart failure, respectively. Examples of these drugs include empagliflozin, dipagliflozin, and canagliflozin. Of these three, empagliflozin, sold under the brand name of Jardiance, has the overall best risk-benefit ratio across different populations. Advantages of these meds in general include modest weight loss, empagliflozin and canagliflozin, decrease cardiovascular mortality in high-risk patients with type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic heart disease, and all three decrease heart failure hospitalizations and decrease the progression of nephropathy. Regarding contraindications, it's recommended to not initiate them if the GFR is below 30, but it's okay to continue in a patient already on one until they become dialysis dependent. Common side effects include acute kidney injury, likely caused by hypovolemia from the diuresis, increased risk of a variety of GU infections. They are associated with a newly described entity of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, in which patients develop all the symptoms, signs, and lab abnormalities of DKA, but at near normal serum glucose levels. And lastly, canagliflozin has been found to increase the risk of lower limb amputations and bone fractures via an unknown mechanism. Next are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. To remind you, these stimulate glucose-dependent insulin release from the pancreas. Common examples include exanatide or bieta, liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide. Almost all of these are given as subcutaneous injections, which is a major limitation, with the exception of a once-daily tablet form of semaglutide, approved in 2019 and marketed under the trade name Ribelsis. As previously noted, GLP-1 agonists can lead to modest weight loss. Also, most of these meds have been shown to decrease a variety of adverse cardiovascular outcomes in high-risk patients with atherosclerotic heart disease. Regarding contraindications, these have been associated with an increased risk of medullary thyroid cancer in animal models. Although this has not been confirmed in humans, a personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer is considered to be a contraindication. Keep in mind that only a small minority of thyroid cancers are the medullary type. Because there is an association between GLP-1 receptor agonists and pancreatitis, 
This is also considered to be a contraindication. Side effects for these meds are mostly GI, including the potential to worsen pre-existing gastroparesis. And there are the previously mentioned issues with pancreatitis and thyroid cancer. Now, we are starting to get to the medications with less of a well-defined role in 2020, despite the fact that they are nevertheless commonly prescribed. The DPP-4 inhibitors do exactly what it sounds like they would do. These include citagliptin, saxagliptin, and linagliptin, all of which are once daily tablets. They don't really have any specific advantage over other drug classes. It's recommended to avoid combining these with GLP-1 receptor agonists. They are also associated with pancreatitis. And saxagliptin specifically is contraindicated in heart failure. Common side effects include joint pains and myalgias and the aforementioned associations. And the last specific class I'll discuss individually are the sulfonylureas. These meds bind to the ATP-sensitive potassium channel in pancreatic beta cells, triggering insulin release. Virtually all sulfonylureas currently used are second-generation sulfonylureas, including glipizide, glimipiride, and glyburide. Their major advantage is low cost. Glyburide is contraindicated in chronic kidney disease, and the reason these drugs are near the end of the list, despite their long history and established track record of providing effective glycemic control, is that they cause weight gain and, among treatments, have the highest risk of causing hypoglycemia, excluding insulin. Here's a summary of most of the interventions for type 2 diabetes which directly impact glycemic control, listed in order of typical improvement in hemoglobin A1c with initiation and optimization of treatment. Since diabetes is predominantly a disorder of insulin deficiency or insulin resistance, it makes sense for exogenous insulin to be the most effective treatment. But interestingly, lifestyle modifications referring predominantly to a combination of improved diet and weight loss is as effective or more effective than any other medication we have. I won't read through the rest of the chart since it's largely a summary of what I've just been going over, but the info is here if you'd like to pause the video. Now moving on to discuss how to determine which medication to use in a specific patient. While this may not be the most controversial topic in medicine, there is nevertheless disagreement in recommendations and even more so in how doctors actually practice. And this brings me to the treatment algorithm. The algorithm I'll present here is admittedly oversimplified but is generally consistent with recommendations from the American Diabetes Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Links to both professional society recommendations will be in the video description. The first considerations are the A1C and whether the patient is directly symptomatic from the diabetes, which is not common. If asymptomatic and with an A1C below about 7.5, give or take, Lifestyle modifications alone is generally recommended with a recheck of A1C in three months. Remember that improved diet typically brings the A1C down one to two points. This does, of course, assume that the patient is motivated and otherwise able to change their diet. If successful, that's great. Continue that plan and monitor the A1C every three to six months. If not successful, or if lifestyle modifications are either not possible or not desirable to the patient, then metformin is the way to go. If a patient is asymptomatic but with an A1C above 7.5, they should also get metformin, plus lifestyle modifications to the extent possible. The one caveat here is that some clinicians advocate for starting insulin in any patient whose A1C is above 10, irrespective of symptoms. Now, what do you do for the patient who is either intolerant of metformin or who needs a second agent either because metformin monotherapy was tried and found to be insufficient, or because prospectively their A1C is so high that metformin monotherapy seems unlikely to be enough. If the patient has coronary artery disease, add a GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitor. If the patient has heart failure or nephropathy, add an SGLT2 inhibitor. If the patient has none of the above, any non-contraindicated medication is reasonable to add, including insulin. You'll want to consider cost, side effect profile, and impact on weight. Allowing your patient to be an active and engaged part of that decision 
is probably more important than the actual drug chosen. And for any patient who is directly symptomatic from hyperglycemia, with such symptoms being polyuria or weight loss, insulin use, at least temporarily, is strongly recommended. After initiating insulin for the first time, in addition to immediate diabetes and insulin education, the patient should be reassessed in person in no more than one to two weeks, just to check out how everything is going. Which actually reminds me at this point that any patient with newly diagnosed diabetes, irrespective of A1C, should receive a whole list of other interventions, including education, dietary counseling, eye and kidney evaluations, and in almost all cases, a statin for improving their lipid profile though these are outside the scope of this particular video. Given the constantly changing landscape of diabetes treatment, I'm going to end by looking over the most commonly prescribed medications in the U.S. Here are the top 16 drugs in 2017, which is the most recent available data. There is a fair bit of variety here. And if we take away insulin and combine the drug classes, this is what we're left with. Metformin is, by a huge margin, the most commonly prescribed med, followed by the sulfonylureas, and then DPP-4 inhibitors, which may be a little unexpected given that the algorithm I just discussed did not emphasize those latter two drugs. However, it's my impression and anecdotal experience that these numbers have shifted a lot in the last few years, driven largely by recent large trials, 